Part is good. It's made by Professor Doug Amy. He's a professor at Mount Holyoke College. And it talks actually about a day in the life of the federal government's budget and what happens as a result of federal spending in our midst. Then we as taxpayers, those of us who pay taxes, we give back again into that pot called the federal fund. And the federal fund is the largest pot of money, and that pays the nation's bills. Others contribute to that. Corporate taxes at a much, much reduced rate, excise tax, gift tax, all of that. They contribute, but individuals, you and I, are the main contributors to the federal fund pot. And that pays for about two-thirds of the budget. Uh, another third of it is paid through Social Security, the FICA taxes on our checks, so our Social Security check, uh, taxes and those, that goes in the trust fund and pays that. Okay, so that's how we relate to the federal budget. So remember what these two good people who started us off said, their notion of how they would spend a tax dollar was. And this is actually how it was spent in 2009. We get our numbers directly from our nation's government. So the federal government releases every, with every budget, how the previous budget was spent. And these are the most recent tax numbers available. So 26.5 cents of every single one of federal income tax dollars in 2009 was spent in the military. Uh, and then 5.4 additional cents on military-related debt. Now, 2009 actually has a lower spending rate than 2008. In 2008, it was, um, actually, I think it was approaching 38.9 cents of every individual federal income tax dollars. It was because 2009 had a stimulus, right? And we had a troubled asset relief program. And therefore, the proportionality actually decreased for military spending in 2009. It's still a significant portion. It's Department of Defense budget line items, right? It's the 051, 052 if you're a budget person, line items in the federal budget itself. In 2009, it did not include the U.S. spending on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, because you will remember that President Bush funded those outside of the budget, right? So if President Bush borrowed that money for nine years through these things called emergency supplementals, um, and it were eight years. And of course, the emergency supplementals were indeed not emergencies. They were well known um, needed budget items. He chose, though, not to put them into the budget, and therefore he never had to account for the spending or the revenue necessary to actually meet those. So he borrowed. So during the Bush administration, in part as a result of the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in part due to tax cuts for the wealthiest in the United States, President Bush actually succeeded in doubling our national debt, um, which is now $12.6 trillion. Uh, so, go ahead. Um, are private contractors and military Sure, the contractors like Boeing or Halliburton, the people who make some of the weapons that we purchase, they would be through the Department of Defense budget. Um, that would be part of the way. Blackwater, sure. Sure. Now, not all, a company like Blackwater, for example, that might do security, consulting security, not all of that would be through the Department of Defense, per se, because, say, for example, the State Department in Iraq and Afghanistan also uses contractors, so we might see military spending show up in other line items. My colleague Chris Hellman has a piece out, it's in our security spending primer, it's available online, and he actually looks at a much more um, liberalized, if you will, uh, look at spending, and he combs out um, military spending in the whole budget, and we approach one trillion dollars of each individual budget, if we actually think of the, the different ways that the agencies themselves are using military-related contractors in their own work. Uh, in, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Um, well, there was a question from, you said before about you know, Bush and his farm. So, in Bush, you know, the administration, there's this picture is not including money borrowed for no. you know, our little war over here. But if you could be in the yellow, the interest on debt, because it's increasing the debt by borrowing money. It would just simply be the interest, not the actual principle okay, of so the money. The interest on that debt is, is recognized and realized in this. Yeah, but, but not the actual sums, not the hundreds of billions. No, no. So we just, just for a moment. 
moment just to take this in, um, we'll see that actually in government, it actually increased five cents um, at each dollar uh, from 2008 to 2009. That's the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, that's the bank bailout. Uh, and also because of the stimulus, the income security and labor, the, this bar here, housing, community, and food, I'm sorry for the, it's a little bit fuzzy, um, are higher this year in 2009 than they were. So in 2011, when we correct back, um, we will see food actually drop substantially. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, much better, thank you. Um, so then we have 3.5 cents for veterans benefits, and then 2.5 cents for energy and the environment, 2 cents for education, very different than your 25 cents, and 1.3 cents for international affairs. One of the great myths of our nation is that we sort of hemorrhage money internationally for international aid, that we are the, a little bit of the saviors of the world, if you will. And in fact, it's 1.3 cents of every one of your individual federal tax dollars last year. And that's everything. That's all the money that we pay in di diplomatic programs abroad. That's every single dollar of international aid. Um, so that's really an important thing for us to take in. So, so it's one of the myths that drives us. Yeah, it depends on how it goes, but sometimes relief for Haiti might come in the form of a supplemental, so it wouldn't, but mostly it's in the budget. So yes, go ahead. Uh, does the military include services for veterans? No, veterans, we separate out veterans. That's the 3.5 cents. Um, we separate it out because we think it's a different conversation. Um, so that's veterans affairs, um, veterans benefits. Yes, ma'am. Military, military aid's in the DOD budget, the Department of Defense budget. Yeah, so that's, that would be a militarized portion. So here's a median income family in Bangor, Maine, uh, in 2009, paid approximately $3,800. This you know, is given census data. And this is how that family, this is just by way of example, this is how that family's $3,800 in federal income tax breaks out. And we can say, you know, 95 of that 3,800 goes to energy, environment, science. Remember, that's an aggregated category. So that's all scientific exploration money, all research and development, all of our national parks. Uh, that's all of that, and it's $95. Um, food, 141, and then you see the rest. So science covers um, cancer research, AIDS research. Science, yeah, medical. cancer research, everything medical. Okay. So then think for a moment with me about, again, where federal funds land in our communities. They land in the form of Head Start programs in Title I, Head Start being early childhood education, uh, opportunities preschool, Title I, of course, for our high schools. They come into our city hall in the form of uh, big block grants called CDBG block grants that help people overhaul sewer systems, help people with their grids and their infrastructure problems. They come in the form of vouchers, like a Section 8 voucher or affordable housing voucher to help people actually, or, or home ownership loans actually, to help people live in safe housing. Um, they're in anti-poverty programs, youth programs, they're in after-school programs. Again, the money comes from the federal government, it goes to the state. Some of it's just directly federal money, so it comes into our local communities like that. Some of it is matched with state funds and comes in. It'll depend state by state, program by program. State agencies, of course, these are the entitlements, Medicaid, Medicare, TANF is temporary assistance for needy families, that's our, what we think of when we think of the welfare, traditional welfare program, the NET program, uh, jobs programs, um, that's the vocational training, that's a little bit of unemployment, uh, but mostly it's a retraining, and of course, SNAP, that's the new name for food stamps, so that's, that's the food vouchers. Um, this is more unemployment benefits, and then colleges, these are the Pell Grants, the student loans, um, the grants to schools, uh, state colleges, universities, and uh, community colleges. I was actually just in Wayne, New Jersey, and Wayne, New Jersey is a state school in the New Jersey system. Uh, it's at William Patterson University, forgive me. And when I asked myself, these are mostly 90% of their kids are first generation kids, uh, and 100% they think, um, or cl as close to it as they can get, are working themselves through school. And when I asked the students who I was speaking with um, if they accessed a Pell Grant to go to school, everybody raised their hands and one by one talked about the small, um, small the, the size of the Pell Grant vis-a-vis -vis what actually their tuition is. Vis -vis this at the same time as Pell Grants are $5,500 now with a little bit of an increase from the Obama administration. 
um, their state tuition is going up and up and up. So really, Pell Grants are not keeping pace with the cost of education. But there you have it. But they're still valuable tools to get our kids um, into higher education opportunities. Okay, so what's at stake? Um, these are some sobering numbers. Um, the poverty rate, you may have heard, the new census data was out, poverty is up. Um, in the United States, the poverty rate rose actually more than a percentage point. In Maine, um, we understand it's actually more than 47,000 of your children are living right now in poverty. Uh, home foreclosures in August up, the highest on record. Uh, more than 50 million, again, in the new census information just out. That's up from last year, up 4 million from last year, from 2000, actually these are 2009 numbers, so they're up from 2008. Uh, we still see across the country racial and economic disparities in terms of access to education and unemployment, right? We have issues, we have issues of underemployment, right, and unemployment. So underemployment is of course the folks who have to work two and three jobs um, to actually just put it together. That's your issue of living wage or, or full employment. Um, and I actually will tell you that I just picked up a Pew Research study before I came, and uh, Pew just has a study out just yesterday that says as of August 2010, 4.4 million people, which is roughly the size of Louisiana, the uh, state of Louisiana, so 4.4 million people have been out of work for one or more years, uh, and that's up 30% um, from a year ago. So that's a, that's a very sobering statistic. And you've lost in your state, it may be well over 26,000, but these are the national figures that we're able to join, draw from. Yes, sir. And you can easily add a couple more points to that unemployment rate in terms of the, the millions of people that have been unemployed for so long that they become so discouraged. Yes. And, and they're 